Anne Hilary Hollinger, my colleague from the center. Uh, I'm going to ask Hilary to provide us with a opening in a good way. Hello. Thank you, Natalie. Um, Chukma, Chinchukma, Sahochafoat, Hilary Hollinger, Chakasha Saya, Shoei Ixa Saya. That was hello, how are you? My name is Hillary Hollinger, and I'm Chickasaw, I'm Raccoon Clan. I'm also from Oklahoma and based out of Oklahoma City. Um, as Natalie said, I'm a technical assistance coordinator here at the center. On behalf of OJJDP Tribal Youth Training and Technical Assistance Center, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar on tribal youth and social media by starting off in a good way. Um, in the chat box below, if you could share with us your name, where you're from, and why you do the work that you do, I think that would help us remind us all while we are here today and also set a good foundation for the information that we'll be receiving. Um, for me, I'm here working for our tribal youth because I know their importance and recognize that they're the future of our communities. Particularly for today's session, it's such an appropriate topic with school starting. Some of you may have kids that are back in school or almost back in school. Some of you may work with kids who are headed back to school as well. Um, today, we would like for you to think of things from a youth perspective. Uh, you know, they're excited to be back in school with their friends hopefully um, meeting new friends, forming new connections, and eventually connecting with one another on social media. Um, as we'll find out later today, um, their interactions on social media can have profound effects on their lives and our communities. So today we just want to pay close attention to the information and keep in mind how important this topic is for youth in our communities. Um, I also wanted to take this time to recognize that some of the information and content of this webinar is typically something that isn't discussed formally. Um, today we'll learn about things like sexting, pornography, and online sexual behavior of youth. With that being said, um, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you and Chukmash Uh Next, we'll have... Thanks so much, Gandra. Um, for those of you who aren't previously familiar with us, uh, we are the OJJDP Tribal Youth Training and Technical Assistance Center. We're located in Oklahoma City on the University of Oklahoma Health Science Center campus. Uh, we are part of the Department of Behavioral Pediatrics and the Center of, on Child Abuse and Neglect. Specifically, we're part of the Indian Country Child Trauma Center under the direction of Dr. Dolores Subia Bigfoot. Um, we provide training and technical assistance to OJJDP grantees in their tribal youth programs and healing to wellness courts. Um, you can find us online at tribalyouthprogram.org. Uh, there you'll find more information on the center, uh, resources that we have provided, other archived webinars, um, blog posts, a virtual library, and you can also request any training and technical assistance from the website as well. Um, I'm going to go over just a quick overview of today's webinar. Um, we've included a bit of an introduction so far as to who we are and what we do here at the center. Um, today we're so lucky and happy to be joined by Dr. Erin Taylor. She's currently an assistant professor at OU Health Science Center and the Center of, on Child Abuse and Neglect, where we are as well. She completed her doctoral work at the University of Missouri and her undergraduate at Vanderbilt. Her primary clinical interests include assessment and treatment of ch children exhibiting problematic sexual behavior and who have a history of experiencing trauma. In addition, her research interests focus on the dissemination and implementation of evidence-based treatments for underserved populations youth, as well as youth engaging in electronic and online sexual behaviors. Um, Dr. Taylor is currently the program coordinator and lead clinician for the treatment program for children with problematic sexual behavior for preschool children, and she previously served as the lead clinician in the problematic sexual behavior programs for school-age children. Um, additionally, her clinical activities, um, Dr. Taylor is actively involved in multiple research projects focused on um, children and adolescents exhibiting problematic sexual behavior. We're so thankful to Dr. Taylor for being with us today. 
Um, it's a topic that's new to so many of us, but so prevalent and so important. Uh, at the end today, we'll have ways to apply the information to your tribal youth programs and in your Healing to Wellness course, and also answer any questions you may have. Um, next, Natalie will go over the learning objectives for the session. Thank you, Hillary, for that wonderful opening and welcoming. And I want to underscore, once again, welcome everybody to this very topical and timely webinar. Our learning objectives today are to impart knowledge regarding youth and their use of electronic devices and social media generally. Second, to increase awareness of behaviors in the, quote, digital world and their real life implications for problematic or illegal sexual behaviors among youth. And third, to discuss the application of this knowledge to tribal youth programs and juvenile healing to wellness program activities. Next is a Dr. Taylor's section, and I'd like to hand over the uh, presentation to Dr. Taylor. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hello. Um, hopefully you all can hear me okay. Um, thank you for that um, introduction. I am Erin Taylor at the National Center on the Sexual Behavior of Youth here at the um, University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center, as they've said. Um, I will be talking about some research that I've done on youth with problematic sexual behavior and their use of electronics to engage in sexual behaviors. Um, but I'll be talking just a lot today about kind of what the research has said about youth engagement in these behaviors and some larger discussion points around that. Um, I just have a disclaimer that um, the uh, research that I've done has been supported by grants from the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, and I do not speak for them. So just want to make that clear. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about this concept of um, a digital native versus a digital immigrant. This was an early um, kind of conceptualization of thinking about the difference in um, how people have been raised in technology. So the idea is that someone who is a digital native are those who are sort of native speakers of digital language, of computers, video games, the internet, et cetera. Whereas a digital immigrant is somebody who was not born into the digital world and has become immersed in it over time. Um, sort of some arbitrary discussions have put that cut off around like 1980, so if you were born um, pre or post-1980, you're either a native or an immigrant. I think we all recognize that it's not such a clear cutoff, and it's much more of a continuum in terms of our awareness and our comfort with technology. Um, and so there's been some, a lot of conversation and a lot of discussion about um, whether that's a good sort of good nomenclature for thinking about it. But I think it's an interesting way of kind of thinking about um, that there are sort of some differences between different populations, particularly youth versus adults, and their knowledge and awareness and comfort with technology. Another more recent sort of idea or uh, thinking through, <clears throat> excuse me, of um, this concept is something considered, uh, we think about it as a digital visitor versus a digital resident. Um, and this is more of that continuum um, component. So, that you can be kind of have a continuum of, of online engagement. So if you're in visitor mode, you're using technology to like meet a predefined task. So you are trying to maybe get on to find the phone number for a business that you're looking for, or use the map to um, go where you need to go. But then you get off of line once you have found that information. Um, and so it doesn't really have a lot of visibility. Alternatively, resident mode is where you're using technology to make connections to other people. So your social media, um, you are, you know, leaving reviews on things, etc., and that's kind of this per or percentage of your life is lived online and via the internet. And there's a lot of online visibility while in this mode. People can identify you um, when you're in this mode online. So I think there's sort of a mix. Um, we often will engage in one or both depending on the goals. But I think as you see younger and younger. Um, populations, they tend to live much more in that resident mode and they spend more time in that mode. So again, these are just sort of different ways of thinking about um, this difference between um, certain populations. And again, I think regardless of what terminology we're using, there is often a disconnect between youth and adults 
regarding technology usage. And I, that's going to kind of be reflected throughout uh, the webinar today and the conversation that we have. And that it's a challenge that I think us as adults, um, uh, I'm even kind of born technically in that digital um, native phase, but I still find there's a very big difference between myself and teenagers today and their use of technology. And that can be a challenge to kind of overcome. So um, youth's access to technology has increased dramatically over the past several decades. But just in the past six years, we've seen a huge increase in technology usage. So as of a survey that was done in like about 2017 um, and published in 2018, 95% of youth ages 13 to 17 own or have access to a smartphone. And that is up from just seven, uh, from 75% in 2015 and 23% surveyed in 2012. So that's a huge jump from 23% to 95% in just six years. 45% um, of the youth surveyed in 2018 say that they are online almost constantly, which was up from 24% in 2015. So that's nearly doubled. Um, and there's not a ton of specific information on American Indian and Alaskan Native youth. I found one study that was surveyed in 2009 that had similar rates. So 75% reported using the internet, 78% reported using cell phones, and 36% reported playing video games on a daily or weekly basis. So it um, seems to be sort of in the same vein and, and using youth today are using a lot of technology. Um, I've sort of just put some of these slides on here of different apps that um, youth are using. I'm going to talk about a little bit more here in a second. But these are commonly what we see, um, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat, Kik, um, or WhatsApp, those kinds of uh, messaging apps that are outside of maybe the cell phone messenger system. Um, I have a calculator up here because um, many of you may already be aware. Um, some people are not. But there is something called like a Calculator Plus app, and there are multiple of them in different app, app stores. And it looks like a calculator. It functions completely like a calculator. But if you enter like a predetermined code, you um, get into sort of the back side of the app. And that is where you can save pictures. You can message privately. And it can be hidden from people because it looks on your phone like it's a calculator. Um, so it's sort of a secret app that um, youth and adults can use to save things that they want to keep away from prying eyes. Um, there was a, in that survey from 2018 they, and 2015, they asked the youth about what apps they use most commonly. Um, probably not surprisingly, in 2015, Facebook was the most commonly used. Almost half reported that it was what they used the most often, followed by Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, um, Google+, Plus, et cetera. In 2018, it's changed dramatically. So Facebook has fallen down to only 10% use it most commonly. Um, it sort of has become, I think Facebook has become known as sort of, um, for lack of a better term, sort of more of an old person's app. I use it a lot, right? It's more for adults. Um, and kids don't tend to use it very frequently anymore. Instead, they're using um, Snapchat much more frequently, where your pictures or your texts sort of disappear after a very um, brief window of time. Also, YouTube is very commonly used, which is interesting. Um, youth watching a lot of videos. And although I think people like to think that YouTube can be um, just sort of a very generic, safe way of watching lots of videos, there's actually quite a bit of sexual content available um, without any sort of age restrictions on it. So you have to be cautious about that as well. So just seeing a, a change and a shift in the way that youth are using apps and technology. Um, also, really interestingly, they ask youth about their perspectives on tech technology. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Is it both? Neither? Um, you could see about half of them thought it had neither a positive nor a negative effect, just part of their life. 31% said that technology um, and social media particularly had a mostly positive effect. And they talked about things like helping them to connect with friends and family, meeting people with similar interests, being able to stay up to date on information, things like that. Really interestingly, though, almost a quarter said that social media has a mostly negative effect on their life. Um, and they talked a lot about bullying and rumor spreading, really harming relationships on an in-person level. If you're only online, you don't really develop in-person relationships. Having Giving kids an unrealistic view of other people's lives, which I think we all know is true, right? We all very carefully curate what we put online and, and often only put the best side of ourselves forward. And that can be really challenging. Um, and 
sort of depressing for youth maybe who don't see themselves having those same experiences, um, causing distractions and addictions and peer pressure. So it's interesting to me to see how well, um, or how youth, I guess, are sort of perceiving technology and recognizing both the positives and the negatives that can come along with it. Um, along with all these concerns and kind of getting to the heart of the matter for today's talk is that, you know, as they're having all of this access to technology, there's been increased concern about their engagement in a, what I'm sort of dubbing electronic and online sexual behaviors. So any sexual behaviors that occur via technology or the Internet, I'm kind of including under this larger term. Specifically, what we're going to talk about today are the sending and receiving of sexual messages, images or videos, like sexting. Um, or viewing online pornography. There are also others um, that I'm not going to spend a lot of time on today, but may be really relevant in some of the work that you do. And, and um, I'll have some resources at the end that may be, um, uh, sorry, uh, maybe of interest to you in terms of like um, sexual online ex exploita exploitation and things like that. Um, so just thinking about pornography and what's available online. The largest um, website of pornography every year publishes their yearly statistics. It's Pornhub.com. Um, I would not go to Pornhub.com because I think that will take you to the pornography website. But if you search for their insights or their year in review, they give you the details of basically what's been on their website. And in 2016, just two years ago, uh, they had over 23 billion visits to their website. Now, obviously, this is not just youth. This is all visitors. Um, it's hard for them to track ages of um, those who come, but uh, come to their website. But they have uh, over 91 billion videos that were viewed, which is 12.5 video. Uh, uh, can you hear me okay now? I'm sorry if you can't hear me. Um, I'm trying to stay close to my. Well, I'll try to speak up a little louder. Um, okay, so uh, over 91 billion videos were viewed, which is about 12.5 videos for every person on Earth that were viewed last year. Uh, and 99 gigabytes of data were streamed per second from their website. Just a year later, they had over 28.5 billion view, or, uh, visits, which is five and a half billion more visits to their website in one year than the year before. Over four million videos were uploaded, which if you were to watch those videos back to back would last you 68 years. Um, and 118 gigabytes of data were transferred per second. So there is a lot of traffic associated with pornography on the Internet. It's hard to track, um, depending on the source and how you're counting kind of Internet traffic. Different uh, research articles and websites will say that it's anywhere from 15 to 30 percent of Internet traffic is accounted for by pornography. There's a lot of pornography available out there. Um, there was a study, now it's a little bit dated at this point, it's over, um, well, it's about 12, 13 years old at this point, um, but they looked at 50 randomly selected videos of the best-selling and most rented pornography to determine basically what kind of pornography was being um, watched. And they looked at the different scenes, so they kind of, um, from those 50 different videos, looked at the different scenes, and 88% of the scenes contained physical aggression, uh, roughly half contained verbal aggression, and in most cases the aggressor was male and the victim was a female. And interestingly, um, when they looked at the victim's response to the aggression, um, it was either positive or neutral in 95% of cases. So if we think about the amount of pornography that is available and then what kinds of pornography is being viewed, you can see how that might be very confusing for a young brain. I mean, it's confusing, I think, for adult brains, but for a young brain to see something that involves a really aggressive sexual act and see being met with a positive reaction, um, how that might make you confused about what um, maybe more normative or typical um, or actual person-to-person -person sexual contact looks like. Um, how many kids are engaging in these behaviors like viewing pornography? Um, the problem is, is that we don't really have a good way of knowing. It's hard to track. Um, there's a lot of different reasons why. So 
um, attitudes towards sexuality vary widely across cultures, as we all know. So a study done in Taiwan may not be relevant for use in the USA. Even um, the United Kingdom has very different attitudes about sexuality and nudity than we do. So it's kind of hard to um, uh, get an estimate across cultures, as we've talked about. Um, you can also see that there's been dramatic changes in technology. So information that was collected just a few years ago may now be obsolete because there's been such a change in the shift in technology. And also, um, as the problem is in many research studies, um, sometimes we define these behaviors differently. And so sometimes people don't draw a distinction between online pornography or offline pornography or don't draw a distinction between intentional exposure and unintentional exposure because it's very easy for any of us, and, and children included, to have unintentional exposure via like a pop-up ad or something like that. The most recent study that I found that was conducted in the United States, um, it was uh, conducted in 2013, and it was for 15 to 18 year olds, and they found that roughly um, two thirds of youth had had unintentional pornography exposure, and about a third had had intentional viewing of online pornography in their lifetime. There was a more recent study um, a few years later, so in 2015, that came from the United Kingdom that had a um, slightly younger sample, 11 to 16 year olds, and found that 21% had reported viewing pornography intentionally in their lifetime, so they had actively sought it out. Um, so it's about one in five 11 to 16 year olds. Um, when looking at kind of who, uh, who views pornography, um, I think it's probably not surprising that um, Every study has basically found that male youth are much more likely than female youth to view pornography. Um, they, some research has found that older youth are more likely to view pornography, particularly if the sample goes down to 10 or 11 years old. But once um, studies that were the youngest age is about 13, they stop finding an effect. So it may be sort of that pubertal timing kind of um, stops making age a really um, relevant factor. Um, there's also been um, study looking at, studies looking at racial differences. Some have found that there's no racial differences in pornography viewing, um, but there was one study that looked at kind of multiple forms, so online versus offline, et cetera, found that African-American youth were more likely to view sexually explicit material than um, white youth. Also, there's been studies that have examined what concerns may be related to viewing pornography. Um, all of these that I'm going to talk about here just quickly are correlational. You know, you can't randomly assign a teenager to view pornography and then see what that leads to for them. So this is all correlational data, but it has been associated in different studies with depression, delinquent or rule-breaking behavior, aggressive behavior, social and attention problems. Um, there's been some studies that have shown sexual aggression to be concerning after viewing pornography, particularly after viewing violent pornography, which is much of the pornography available today. There's also been linkages to other risky sexual behaviors, so things like sex without a condom, um, substance use around sexual encounters, etc. cetera. Um, and that also includes problematic sexual behavior, which I'm going to talk about here in a minute. Um, there's also been links between viewing pornography and sexual victimization. So one study found that male youth with PSD um, with sexual victimization were more likely to view pornography than non-sexually victimized youth, so youth who already had sexual concerns. Um, but also just in general trauma has also been linked with viewing pornography. Um, and what are the effects of viewing pornography? I apologize, there's not a citation on this slide. I must have un unintentionally left it off. It is the same as the UK study that I cited earlier. Um, but they basically asked them, asked youth what their, those who had viewed pornography, how they felt about it when they first saw it. Um, and they reported feeling curious, shocked, or confused on their first pornography viewing, but then the negative feelings that they initially had subsided over repeated viewings of pornography. So when asked to rate their overall attitudes about what they thought about pornography, fortunately about half of them found it to be unrealistic, but they also found it to be arousing and exciting. Some said silly, some said exploitative, and some said scary. Um, there was also a substantial proportion of youth that reported wanting to emulate what they had viewed in pornography. So for 11 to 12 year olds, 21% of them said that they would want to try things that they had seen in pornography, 39% um, for 13 to 14 year olds, and 42% of 15 to 16 year olds. So again, thinking about the kind of pornography that they're viewing, what might they want to try to emulate?
switching gears and thinking about sexting behaviors. Um, so when I say sexting, again, I'm thinking about images that um, are sending or receiving of sexual messages or images, um, or both. There was a meta-analysis recently that looked at all the studies that um, had examined sexting from 2009 to 2016, and basically said that the mean prevalence, so roughly about 15% of youth, and this ranges in age from you know 11 to 18, depending on the study, um, was about 15% sent a sex, and 27% uh, had received a sex. Um, prevalence of sexting increased with date, increased with date of study, so the more newer studies had higher prevalence rates, which I don't think is a surprise. Age of youth as well, so as youth get older, more likely to send a sex. And use of a mobile device versus computer, so more likely to send a sexual message if you have a personal mobile device rather than your computer. Um, interestingly, though, results did not vary across geographic locations. So even though I talked about a minute ago, there's differences in cultural um, excuse me, cultural um, beliefs or um, attitudes about sexuality, no difference in geographic location, no difference by male or female, um, or by the message content, so whether it was a picture only, text only, or both. Who sex? So the meta-analysis, like I said, didn't find a much of a difference in gender, but there are other studies that have suggested that females are more likely to send them and males are more likely to receive. Some have found that males are more likely to send, and some have found no differences. So again, that gender effect for sex, uh, sexting is um, less clear. Uh, typically, though, uh, research continues to find that youth who sext are more likely to be older, so you know, 14, 15, 16, as opposed to 10, 11, 12. Um, and interestingly, well, in looking at racial differences, youth who sext are more likely to be African American versus other racial groups, and that's across multiple studies that has actually found that. Um, similarly um, to the online pornography, sexting is a little bit newer, so there isn't quite as much research on what it's related to, um, but there have been studies that have found that sexting is linked with depressive symptoms, um, with associating with antisocial or delinquent peers, and other risky sexual behaviors again. Um, youth attitudes towards sexting I think is quite interesting as well. Interestingly, about the majority of youth report believe that sexting is a crime, um, which is not the impression that I think a lot of adults have, um, not the impression that I had until I read this study. 86% um, report believing that it can, is a crime. But if you look at the difference between youth who have never sent a sex and those who have, of those who have sent a sex, only about 61% think it's a crime. So it drops. Um, understandably, they're doing it, so they don't think that they're going to get in trouble for it. Um, they asked them about, uh, in, this, in this study as well, asked them kind of about their thoughts, the consequences of sexting, and basically said sexting is extremely likely to, you know, result in all of these things, yes or no. And so um, you can see uh, it is extremely likely to result in trouble at school. 87% who had no sexting involvement said it would cause that problem. 61% um, who have sex, sexting involvement said it would cause that problem result in trouble with the police was a little bit less, hurt your chances of getting a job, hurt your friendships, hurt your romantic relationships, hurt your relationship with family. So you can see in each case, those who have never sexted um, place the uh, risk for these behaviors at a much higher level than those who have. And again, that could be due to that maybe is what is keeping them from sending a sex. Um, or they just have never done it, so they don't, um, they are more likely to accurately see the risk. Um, when it comes to engaging in both sexting and viewing pornography, there isn't a lot of studies. They sort of, um, I think the research has kept them very separate, which would make sense historically, right, to view pornography before the advent of smartphones. You had to have a computer or a video, um, a way to watch a video. And now with smartphones, you can do everything kind of all in one handy-dandy device. And so I think we'll see the research sort of pick up and maybe look at these things at the same time. Um, but they have found that sexting is associated with online pornography use for both male and female adolescents in one study. And in another study where they looked at what they called internet pornography addiction, so maybe a higher level and consumption of internet pornography than a typical youth, um, they did find a relationship between sexting and internet pornography addiction, um, although moderated by alcohol consumption. So if you drank more, you were more likely to have both of those behaviors.
Um, so I'm going to switch gears now to talk a little bit about the studies that I have done um, that are involving youth with problematic sexual behavior. Um, this first study, sorry, excuse me, uh, basically sought to determine how frequently youth with PSD participate in electronic and online sexual behaviors. Um, I haven't, I'm sorry, I have not talked about necessarily what I'm talking about with PSD or problematic sexual behavior. Many of you are probably very familiar with this topic, but when we talk, when I talk about problematic sexual behavior, I'm talking about youth who are engaging in um, developmentally inappropriate or potentially harmful sexual behaviors with themselves or others, typically involving um, their genitals or other sexual body parts, um, as well as other body parts. Um, but, so particularly, um, that's been the population that I have worked with quite a bit clinically, as well as in research. And I was interested in their use of electronics for engaging in sexual behaviors. And then kind of wanted to see, you know, there's that literature that's looked at demographic factors in terms of age and gender and race as well as other kinds of symptoms, um, depression or, or antisocial behavior, is that similarly linked for this population? So I'm just going to kind of run through these slides pretty quickly. They're more research focused, um, uh, but just to kind of give you an idea of who the youth were that we talked to or, or got data from, this was um, 322 youth and their caregivers who were referred for treatment for problematic sexual behavior between 2011 and 2015. And that was at eight different locations across the country, kind of all the, from the West Coast to the East Coast. So a, a very diverse sample, diverse sample. It was part of an ODJDP project conducted here for treatment of youth with PSD. Um, at the time that I pulled this data, we had 408 da um, youth that were referred, and uh, 322 had complete data on the items that I was interested in. The youth were 10 to 14, um, predominantly male. 38% um, African American, 28% white, 24% Hispanic, 1% Asian, and 6.3% multi or biracial. Caregivers were 41 years old, um, majority were female, and identified as biological parents. So that's the participants. You can just see here, um, as we'll talk about in just a minute, kind of what the items were. We looked at all of the youth and their breakdown, as well as the youth who specifically engaged in any of those electronic or online sexual behaviors. So 111 youth had engaged in the sexual behavior. So it's, um, roughly a third had engaged in, in some form of sexual behavior via technology. You can see um, that you know 10-year-olds for the entire sample were about 15%. Only 10% of 10-year-olds of those who had engaged in electronic behaviors were 10-year-olds. So you can kind of see that the we see a specific age increase, right, 10, 16, 20, 25, 27%. So as youth got older, it was more likely that they were going to have um, an electronic or online sexual behavior reported for them. And looking at racial um, differences, um, roughly the same in terms of the percentage of youth who were African American, white, Hispanic, Asian, or other in the larger sample versus those who engaged in those electronic online sexual behaviors, except for, as we'll talk about here in a minute, there is a difference in Hispanic, so it's actually quite a bit um, fewer, less Hispanic youth were reported to engage in those behaviors um, than we might expect based on the larger sample. Um, unfortunately, in this, fortunately or unfortunately, the sample was predominantly male, so there wasn't really any way for us to look at gender differences, and it looks about the same. Um, we did give something called the Youth Sexual Behavior Problem Inventory. It basically just assesses problematic sexual behavior over the last six weeks. Specifically, I was interested in the four items you can see italicized here. So basically, it asked caregivers to rate whether their child had previously, um, never up to sort of four or more times in the past week, viewed pornography on the internet, sent sexual messages via the phone or internet or messaging, shared sexual pictures or videos with others, or pushed others to share sexual images or videos of themselves. There are also five additional items about pro-social, um, and one of which I used um, for the study, which is how frequently you spend time with a friend who stays out of trouble, so trying to look at kind of pro-social peers. Also use the child behavior checklist for those in a clinical setting. You are probably um, familiar with that. It's basically just a broad band measure that looks at lots of different types of internalizing, you know, anxiety, depression, and externalizing disruptive behavior kinds of scales. Um, Again, just very quickly, this was they came for an intake appointment, so they were given this measure as part of the clinical services, 
and then that data was reported back to us. Because it was such a smaller sample and only four items, I did just sum it to kind of create a total score of electronic and online sexual behaviors. Um, so this is the results in terms of the percentages reported. So of the youth with PSB, the total score ranged from zero to seven. Um, the vast majority engaged in viewing online pornography. So if they were going to engage in electronic behavior, um, it was viewing online pornography. And about that's about 34% of youth had engaged in that. Um, sending sexual messages was 11.5% or sending sexual pictures was 7.8%. If I combine those last two to make it be kind of sexual messaging of pictures or videos or text, 15% uh, of youth had, did, had done one of those. And then only 3% had pushed others to send sexual pictures or videos. Uh, when we look at one or more behaviors, so they had uh, engaged in at least one, if not more behaviors, it was 34%, 34.5%. So if they engaged in any behavior, it was pornography viewing, and then they might have also engaged in sexting, if that makes sense. Um, this is, again, kind of a staffy slide here, but it's just the bold pieces are kind of what is important. Those were what significantly predicted engagement in electronic and online sexual behaviors. So age was positively associated with it, which basically means as youth got older, they were more likely to have these behaviors. Hispanic youth were less likely to engage in electronic um, and online sexual behaviors as reported by their caregivers compared to um, the other youth. If they had pro-social peers, they were also less likely to engage in electronic and online sexual behaviors. Um, and Interestingly, if they had a higher rule breaking, so uh, basically they tend to break rules score, that was linked with um, engagement in electronic and online sexual behaviors. But we didn't find any effect for um, gender, as we talked about, or anxiety, depression, social or attention problems, or aggressive behavior. Um, so just some conclusions quickly about this study, or kind of briefly. Um, for youth with problematic sexual behavior, so youth who have pre-existing other kinds of interpersonal sexual behavior concerns, it may be that they are engaging in electronic and online sexual behaviors at a higher rate than non-clinical or sort of more typical um, population. So in the study sample, it was about a third who had intentionally viewed pornography in recent history, so in the past six weeks or a little bit before that. In a non-clinical sample, as we talked about, 21% of UK youth ages 11 to 16 had reported intentional viewing. So that's uh, one-fifth as opposed to one-third. Uh, for sexting, they may be um, a little bit closer to um, samples including older youth. So that study that we talked about had older youth, and it was about 15%, or excuse me, 15% had sent uh, sex in their lifetime. And in our study, it was 15% in recent history. So they may be more similar to older youth um, than, than other, um, other populations. Again, not a surprise, I don't think, to anybody that age significantly predicts the rates of engagement in these behaviors. So, you know, as youth are developing into adolescence and uh, going through puberty, they're becoming increasingly interested in romantic and sexual relationships. Um, and older youth have more time to engage with technology in these behaviors than younger youth. Um, as we'll talk about in a minute, you know, there's some conversation about what is typical for this, this population of youth now. They, they, they have grown up with technology their entire lives. They've been documented by their parents since birth um, in terms of pictures and, and documenting everything. So is it really outside the norm of them for them to explore their sexuality also in an online arena um, that just wasn't really available for um, kids 20, 30 years ago growing up? Uh, Hispanic youth, interestingly, were less likely to engage in behaviors than non-Hispanic youth. Um, there is one study that has actually found that Hispanic caregivers were more likely than white or black caregivers to talk with their youth about what is appropriate content to view online. There's also some, um, you know, specific cultural beliefs held about Hispanic youth and their families in terms of family conversations and, and um, family culture that may be uh, playing a role. We also had some conversation, and this is more kind of an anecdotal conversation that we had, is that in um, many of our sample, uh, much of our sample came from California, and many of the youth were sort of first generation um, 
Americans and their parents had, had come from um, Mexico or other places and didn't speak English. So some of the conversation was also maybe it's not that they had more conversations with their youth about electronics, since this was caregiver report, maybe they just weren't aware. Maybe their, their youth are actually a little bit savvier and doing these things um, at the same rates as other populations of youth, but their parents just aren't quite aware of it. Um, interestingly, uh, kind of in line with other research, youth who'd engaged in these behaviors were less likely to spend time with a positive pro-social peer by their parents' report, which kind of leads us to two paths, right? These could be kids who are spending time with antisocial or delinquent peers, so kids who are getting in a lot of trouble. Alternatively, they could also be the kids who are socially isolated and lacking any friends, and that they're engaging in these online behaviors because they don't have social interactions in their environment. So there's sort of two different um, possibilities, and unfortunately, the way that our data was collected, we can't really examine which one it is. Again, anecdotally, knowing the youth who have problematic sexual behavior that we've seen in our clinical programs, I would tend towards it being the latter, actually. Many of these kids are delayed um, socially in a lot of ways and just don't have, um, haven't really developed appropriate friendships with kids their own age. So um, sort of future area for research. But thinking about for caregivers and, and for, um, for your sample as well and for you know, the, the families that you work with, um, if kids don't have a positive pro-social peer, which we know is so important for so many things outside of just these electronic and, and online sexual behaviors, um, if they're isolated, may need to find a way to um, get them involved in a, in a positive activity or develop more appropriate friendships to decrease the likelihood they're going to be online engaging in these um, concerning behaviors. Um, or if they're you know, engaged with a deviant or, or excuse me, delinquent or antisocial peer group, you may need more intensive support from providers or others to really disengage them um, from that antisocial peer group. Um, and then the last uh, finding from this study was that in this population, the youth were more likely to engage in rule-breaking behavior, but not aggressive behavior. And that is in line with some previous research, but also counter to some of that research that I talked about where they saw increases in sexual aggression or aggression in general after um, viewing online pornography. But I think for this, again, the same population we're thinking about youth who have problematic sexual behaviors, um, it may be that engagement is more associated with a general disregard for rules, but not really behaviors designed to harm others, which I think is what we see often in our um, in our population. So youth with problematic sexual behavior are often sort of seen by or believed by society or systems to be really violent and really dangerous. And while the behaviors that they engage in are inappropriate and can cause harm, and in some cases can be violent, um, that sort of more aggressive behavior, um, uh, violent behavior, is really a small sub, sort of subpopulation of the larger population of youth with problematic sexual behavior. Um, I'm going to switch gears and talk about um, the second study that um, I've been working on, which is about professionals' perceptions of these kinds of behaviors. So um, much like, as you probably expect, right, states and jurisdictions vary widely in how they view and manage electronic and online sexual behaviors. So some states consider sexting, and like if a youth were to send an, uh, an image of themselves nude to someone else, they would consider that child pornography, and that youth could be arrested, charged with child pornography, and forced to register as a sex offender um, and have a felony charge on, on um, felony charge. Uh, other states have recognized that that's not, that, that's sort of not the purpose of the child pornography law, right? The child pornography laws are, to, are designed to stop child pornography that is exploitative, um, and a youth who unintentionally or maybe not so wisely takes a picture of themselves and sends it out, that is not their purpose. They're not trying to create child pornography. They are, again, um, potentially engaging in more age-typical behaviors that, um, but are still concerning. And so in that um, sense, some states have really um, developed specific laws to address that type of behavior, um, so more of a youth-produced images um, policy. And so Nebraska, New Jersey, and New York, Nevada, all have specific laws um, where if it's a first-time offense, they may have to go through a diversion program or a training program, um, an education program um, to address that concern. Now, if it was like the second or third or fourth offense, then it moves 
further down um, the line, but early offenses are um, designed to be treated with more juvenile justice treatment kinds of um, models. But no known studies that I have come across have specifically examined how key stakeholders, um, so those individuals like yourselves who come into contact with youth, how they perceive these behaviors. Specifically, you know, thinking about juvenile justice, law enforcement, child welfare, child protective services, staff. Um, again, this was a study conducted particularly about youth with PSD, um, so that's who we talk to, is uh, stakeholders who come into contact with these youth as part of their job. Um, and we really thought that uh, they could provide a unique perspective um, on how they view it and kind of a, a broader, help us get a better understanding of how the system is viewing it and what are the challenges that they are facing with these behaviors. Um, and for youth with PSB, but for often many other problem types as well, um, there's no single entry for the youth into the legal system. And so maybe they um, made it through child welfare or child protective services, um, or maybe they came through juvenile justice or law enforcement path. So we wanted to get a lot of different perspectives. Um, so what we did, um, we had a qualitative semi-structured interview. So we conducted interviews over the phone with these individuals. Um, there was a, a, it was a large interview guide, so interviews took about 30 minutes to um, half an hour to about an hour. Um, but specifically for the electronic question, um, we asked basically what are their perceptions of, on the youth use of this technology, use of this technology, frequency and changes over time, severity, impact the behaviors have on families, and their community response. We had 36 stakeholders across a variety of professions, as you can see. The, um, Juvenile justice, child advocacy, mental health organizations, child welfare court system, schools, law enforcement, and then um, a victim advocate from a domestic violence shelter. So as I said, it's part of a larger interview guide, but specifically what we asked were some communities report concern about use of problematic sexual behaviors, use of, use of electronics, like a phone or computer to engage in problematic sexual behavior. What have you seen in your community? So just leaving it up to them to sort of tell us what they're seeing in their community and what concerns they have um, or not concerns they have. And then follow up, asked about what types of behaviors, how, what their view on the severity was, how frequently it's an issue and has that changed over time, and then what's the response of professionals when they're aware of these behaviors. So kind of how does the community respond when they become aware of them. Um, so not surprisingly, Professionals reported that youth engaged in a variety of um, electronic and online sexual behaviors. I should also back up, I'm sorry, I should also say that we specifically asked youth with problematic sexual behaviors and engagement in technology, a uh, use of technology. Interestingly, all of them spoke just very broadly about their caseload. So this, their results really are applicable to all youth who they have come into contact with. They sort of just talked about their caseloads in general. Um, so they're sort of seeing it across um, all youth that they're coming into contact with. Um, but they reported, I guess, uh, again, a variety of behaviors. So sexting coming up quite a bit, um, particularly concerned about the taking and sending of nude photos and viewing online pornography. They also talked about concern about youth engaging in online conversations with strangers, which could then put them at greater risk for later victimization. They talked about um, the use of many different types of electronic devices, like cell phones, computers, tablets. Um, and they talked about social media and mentioned specific applications. So Facebook, YouTube, Snapchat, and Kik were the ones that um, came up in this study. This was done a couple of years ago now. Um, so it would be interesting to see if they're seeing new apps. Um, I find in our own clinical program and just the work that I do with youth, um, it's like, have you heard about this new app? Nope. You know, it's constantly changing. So trying to keep up to date can be a challenge. I think really unsurprisingly, they were like, yep, it's really frequent. <laughs> so it is very frequent in their communities. Um, one person specifically said, it's all over my caseload. So a lot of their youth were engaging in these behaviors with prevalence estimates ranging. Like, so when you just sort of asked about how much of your case, how many of the clients that you work with, et cetera, they ranged from anywhere from a quarter of cases up to three quarters, depending on the community. Uh, and they talked about seeing youth with these behaviors come into their professional spheres on a weekly basis. So I'm not sure if this is, you know, matching what you guys are seeing in your own um, work, if you're seeing these problems come up that frequently. They also talked about um, the severity, many of them being really concerned about the behavior and about kind of um, how severe it is in terms of like rating it about a moderate to high, high severity behavior. So one person said, it's one of my biggest concerns, I would say, the increase in this type of behavior. Um, 
a very small number, but a, a sort of, uh, but at least a, a notable number, actually kind of went the other way and felt like these behaviors are just typical of development and should not be cause for alarm. And so they talked about kids are pushing the boundaries as part of normal teenage adolescent development, just pushing the boundaries. So there's sort of um, kind of either side here, but they also, many did still talk about the concern that they have for the potentially serious repercussions that youth could face because of these behaviors. Um, they talked about, of course, involvement increasing over time with um, changes beginning anywhere in the last six months to the past 10 years. I think some of that had to do with how long some of these people had been in their positions. Some of them were newer, some had been, were veterans that had been in their jobs for many, many years. Um, and they talked about that increase in the behaviors being linked to that increase in Internet and technology access, just as we talked about. So years ago, you only had access to the Internet when you could sit down in front of a computer. Now the kids have a computer in their pocket, and they can access it any time. Children's accessibility to social media, easy access to social media at younger ages definitely puts them way more at risk. We're talking about that idea that the younger kids who don't have um, as much understanding may unintentionally kind of get themselves into dangerous situations or potentially risky situations. They also talked about families not understanding the potential implications, both the youth and their caregivers, not getting the ramifications. So ramifications being potentially negative personal consequences, so um, not understanding that the images are permanent. Uh, and there's nothing you can do So once they're out there. So once it's out there on the Internet, there's no way to take it down. Like you can take it down on one site, but you don't know where it's gone, um, which comes up quite a bit, right? Um, often with the youth that we see, when they've had these behaviors, there's an attempt to sort of track down where it's gone, but it, it can fly so quickly to so many different websites or different people that it's really impossible to do that. They also talked about <clears throat> excuse me, the behavior leading to strong um, negative emotions, so we have kids that are embarrassed or depressed, some become suicidal, it's, it's really bad. So youth who these images do get sent out to everyone um, or they send them out and have, get a negative response, really having a very strong negative reaction to, um, to having that happen. Um, they also talked about the potential legal consequences. Some of these kids about fall out of their chair when I tell them, you're in possession of child pornography, or you distributed child pornography, and you know you could go to prison for 15 years for that. They don't even know what to think. Um, or I just don't think that kids really understand the seriousness of it. I mean, they could end up on the sex offender registry. And those are all potential consequences depending on the state that they are in. Are they common consequences? No. Um, so sometimes I think, um, you know, we as adults are like, oh, but this is, could be what happens. But the majority of kids aren't going to have this happen. So the risk in a lot, you know, <laughs> risk kids who already don't think that they're in danger of any sort of negative outcomes because their frontal lobes haven't developed really don't see the risk of this um, being as serious because it's just very unlikely to happen, even though it could. Um, they also talked about the challenges of supervising youth online. And I know this comes up all the time in, in working with families clinically is that caregiver, they talked about caregivers needing to supervise and how important that is, but how much caregivers struggle with doing that. Um, that caregivers are often significantly less savvy than their children are about electronics. So the kids are a lot more educated than adults are in how to use half of these devices. One of my biggest challenges is to educate parents about the internet because most of them are clueless. Um, and if we think about different families, oftentimes we'll see here clinically um, families where it's a grandparent um, who is raising a child. And so the, the digital divide is even greater in that sense. And it can be really challenging for parents and caregivers to know how to adequately monitor. And, one, um, and we've talked about that the idea that the prevalence of technology is what makes it so hard to monitor. And I think we've all come across that. But now every kid seems to have their own computer and a cell phone. So, you know, parents will check the history on the computer and not even think that they're accessing the Internet on their cell phone until they get the bill. So there's just so many different avenues that youth can go down in order to get access online, and um, it's just really, really hard to supervise and to do that adequately um, and to make sure that youth are safe. Um, and then community response. So uh, the most common community response, which is still about a third of, of uh, stakeholders response, reported that about, um, about a third of them, excuse me, reported that families are given education regarding the negative implications in supervision. So they give education of some kind to the families, only in about a third of the cases. 
a third of the people reported this. Actually, what was more common is that there was no consistent response, that there was varied um, sort of uh, inconsistency was the only consistent. Some said that response is dependent on the experience of the professional or the details of the case. Some said that there was an overreaction in their community, particularly with regards to charging. Some said that there was an under-response in their community, basically saying that they ignore these behaviors. Um, and that was sometimes by, said by two stakeholders in the same community. So one would say there was an overreaction, one would say there was an underreaction. Um, some people talked about um, some sort of maybe poor policies that criminal justice systems have tried and that aren't really very effective. So trying to ban youth access to all forms of technology, and one professional noted that's nearsighted because all you have to do is say, hey, friend, hand me your cell phone for a second. And that's the case, right, is that you can't really, if a judge tries to order no technology for this youth, that's just nearly impossible to make sure it happens. Um, anymore, a lot of schools use technology as part of their homework assignments. Um, and so they have to have access to a computer in order to, to submit things like that. Um, many of them talked about just no one in their community really knowing how to respond or what to do, and that the lack of legislation and overarching policy about these behaviors is what makes it really, really challenging to address. Um, so just some overall conclusions from this study, you know, behaviors that um, I think interestingly too as we think about, you know, behaviors that are typically or relatively benign, we just, as I, I said, you know, earlier, typical behaviors where youth may be exploring their, you know, typical development of sexuality is now happening online. But that can have um, much more negative effects because it did happen online. So it can be complicated and concerning and potentially illegal, right, when it involves electronics. So, you know, mooning someone, that's not atypical, right, of kids to do. But when someone snaps a picture of it and now it's online, then it takes it to a whole different level. Um, professionals, again, largely agreed behaviors were concerning, increasing in frequency and causing, could cause problems for families, but they didn't really know how to respond and that there wasn't any consistency in response. And really, without a protocol or guidelines, inconsistency appears to be the norm. Um, and I'm sure you guys have seen that in your own communities um, and in your own work, is that there isn't consistency in how systems are responding to this. Um, one kind of model that has tried to put some consistency, at least around the sexting idea and typ typologies, um, is uh, something that Finkel Horse Group did um, called Youth Produced Images. Sorry, somebody is calling me right now, so my phone is ringing as I'm trying to talk to you. Apologies. Um, but Finkel Horse uh, Group had come up with this idea of youth produced sexual images. So instead of calling it sexting or sexual messaging, it's youth produced images. So it's, it sort of differentiates it from child pornography. And then looking at the different types of that. So there are aggravated types of youth produced images. So um, that would be adults are involved. Even if the youth produced it, maybe an adult is involved in the picture. Um, and in cases where it's youth only, there may be an intent to harm um, or a reckless misuse. So those cases would be, you know, intent to harm would be that idea of like revenge pornography. So my girlfriend sent me a picture, we have now broken up and I am mad at her, so I send that to the entire school because I want to get back at her for hurting my feelings. That would be that idea of kind of revenge pornography. Um, uh, there's also cases, right, where people have sort of been blackmailed into continuing relationship or engaging in inappropriate behavior because someone had an image of them and they were scared they'd send it to their parents. Um, and then that reckless misuse is maybe it's not I'm not mad at them, I don't want to send harm, but I think it's funny that they sent me this picture, so I'm going to send it to a couple of my friends and they're going to send it to a couple of their friends and now all of a sudden it's, it's across the whole school. Um, but then you have the other side that's um, maybe less... Uh, concerning, and not still concerning, but less um, negative in its approach, so it's experimental. It's romantic. It's happening between, you know, two 16-year-olds who are in a relationship and they're sending images to one another. Um, it could be more sexual attention seeking. So I'm, you know, a teenager and I want people to, to say nice things about me, so I'm going to take a picture and send them out. And then sort of a whole other category that would encompass other things that we haven't talked about. But this idea of kind of this youth produced images could help to sort of form a policy or help you in your own thinking through of, of the youth that you work with. Um, what's the purpose of the behavior? And that should then really be sort of the deciding or help to decide um, how do we address it? If it's experimental, 
and it got them kind of got out in the public. Then we need to talk about what are appropriate behaviors online and how do you keep things private as you move forward um, into adulthood um, versus if someone's intending to do harm, then maybe there needs to be some consequences associated with that um, in terms of punishment because, you know, as a society, we think we see that punishment is, is useful when it's something of that nature and there needs to be a consequence. Um, so we really want to, as I've, I've sort of said a lot of these things already, but really wanting to account for the development of the youth. Um, are they really under, able to understand what they're doing? If it's a nine-year-old who takes a picture and sends it, they, that's very different than a 16 or 17-year-old. Um, what was the intention or other kinds of differences? And really needing that innovative legislation and kind of interdisciplinary strategies because as we talked about, this is not just child welfare that's seeing this, or juvenile justice, or those of us who work at uh, mental health organizations or CACs, it's coming across kind of all of these places. And so really needing an interdisciplinary approach to thinking through how do you, excuse me, address this in a developmentally appropriate way that sort of triages, um, you know, child welfare is needed, behavioral health or mental health or juvenile justice is warranted. And that's just going to take, I think, a lot of energy and thinking through. Um, um, as we talked about, the need for education of youth and caregivers was a strong theme. Um, and what's really, um, I think, challenging is that we don't, um, professionals don't often have a lot of education on this. You know, this is not something I was trained in. I, as I'm a mental health professional, I got trained in treatment models and um, mental health diagnoses. But how does technology fit in with all that? That wasn't addressed when I was in school. I'm sure that's the case for many of, of you out there in the, your different fields, is that you didn't really get kind of that technology piece. And, and part of it is because that, you know, I've been out of school now a little while, and technology has really taken over in just the past decade. Um, you know, it's hard when, when uh, sort of local jurisdictions, you don't have jurisdiction over the Internet or social media, so you can't kind of put things in place because you can't control the Internet, and that, that is a challenge. Um, but really needing appropriate education programs and monitoring strategies that are based on research and policy and are developmentally appropriate uh, in order to help families um, better monitor and have conversations about this. Um, I think that's one thing, too, that um, we'll talk about, I think, in a minute, is that it's going to be impossible for a parent to monitor everything their child does online unless they want to stay awake 24 hours a day reading everything and, and watching everything they do. And that's not realistic, and that doesn't help foster any sort of independence or um, for this youth. And so wanting to have a way that help parents kind of be able to check in as needed but have regular conversations with their youth about what is appropriate, what isn't, how do I want you to be safe online. Um, just some overall conclusions. Uh, and again, I think some of these we've already talked about, but you know, what is normal, typical, and healthy in our current age is a question, and I don't think we have an answer to it. Um, you know, current behaviors quickly become, or research currently kind of becomes quickly out of date, um, but what we really need is kind of baseline education on what is typical concerning problematic and harmful. Um, and I think the other challenge, um, and, and I'm sure I'm, I'm sort of preaching to the choir here, is that, uh, you know, youth can engage in typical behaviors and have it have a harmful outcome online. But also the off, off, opposite is true, is that it can be typical or even non-typical and not have any problems for them. And no one ever finds out or it never becomes an issue. And so I think um, we're in this, this challenge kind of as a society in um, thinking through what we find to be acceptable or not for youth. Um, we want you know prevention efforts to be in place. As I said, the family communication pieces are so important. So, you know, in the way that often um, treatments that address sexual concerns or, um, you know, if there's been a sexual abuse history, having some information about appropriate sex education and healthy relationships is so important. That would be the same here for technology use as well, right? So what, as a family, what are our values about being online? How do we stay safe? Um, and how do parents build autonomy in their youth while also making sure that they are making good decisions? Um, which I think is, I mean, that's across all of growing up, not just technology, but I think we have parents sort of sometimes don't think about that avenue um, and making sure that they're monitoring and watching it carefully. I mean, how often have you seen probably in your professional spheres when you're trying to talk to a parent, mom just says, here, take my phone, kiddo, and play with it for this 15 minutes while we talk. Um, 
And the majority of the time, they're going to play Angry Birds or Candy Crush or some other game, and it's going to be fine. But they could unintentionally or intentionally get on something that we'd be more concerned about. Um, and also, something I didn't talk about today, and, and there's a whole other topic that I think will take um, a lot of um, would take a whole conversation itself is cyberbullying and the effects of cyberbullying, and that is a whole other area um, that has a lot of concern, um, obviously, and, and we've seen a lot of conversations about that. Um, but having, again, parents talk with their kids about these things is so important. Um, just kind of quickly, a few other things. So overall implications, schools really need to also be in, you know, involved in this, right? The kids are, like I said, they're moving towards electronic communication. So students are getting tablets or computers, or there's computers in the classroom. Um, and students, I mean, I've had many a kid who've had those from school and have figured out how to get around all of the school monitoring and, um, you know, they basically jailbreak the phone or, or the tablet so they can get what they want off of it. Um, and so schools, I think, you know, while there's a lot of positives to technology and a lot of good things, we also need to make sure that schools are, are um, doing a good work at, at making sure they have good um, policies and controls over that. Um, we talked about public policy and really consistent education for professionals and, and developmentally appropriate policy. Uh, and then also I think thinking about, and this is a much bigger issue than we could solve on this webinar, but thinking about international public policy on the Internet itself. It is not logical to try to control this child by child, family by family, like device by device. Like, it, that's just impossible to do. Um, and so are there other Internet-wide strategies that we could, as a society, agree on are important for us? Um, so, you know, we've talked about um, here some conversations that have been had about, like, a .xxx designation. It used to be an attempt to try to put all pornography on that and so that you could kind of then have an, at least some sort of age restriction to get onto it to sort of to stop um, or block those a little bit more easily. Uh, it always comes back, at least here in the United States, to a freedom of speech argument, understandably, so they have not been able to sort of move it to a different designation. Um, interestingly, UK has a new um, Digital Economy Act that involves a lot that has to do with privacy um, within their internet um, and service providers, but part of it also addresses internet pornography, and they're making websites have much more clear um, restrictions around age and like verifying age for youth who get, um, for anybody who gets on their website and actually instructs um, internet service providers to cut off those websites' access if they're not in compliance. So there's some, some moves, I think, at a larger policy level to try to help um, with the monitoring and access to some of these things. Um, I also, you know, I've talked about a lot of concerning things um, and, and potential negatives. I also want to talk about the fact that technology has a lot of positives to offer. We all use this every day, I'm sure, right? I'm, I have eight devices that open in front of me right now, right, that I'm using to do this webinar, and um, that has a lot of um, positive outcomes for youth. It can really help to reduce barriers to social interactions for youth who are unable to find youth that are similar to them or have similar interests. Um, it can improve school achievement when it's used at, um, appropriately. And it provides youth with access to cultures and worldviews beyond their own, which I think can be a really positive thing. Um, and as I talked about, the likelihood of a significant negative event from effect from pornography or sexting is low. The one study actually kind of found that like one in five may experience some kind of negative effect. And that is anywhere from like personal embarrassment all the way up to I was arrested for this. So that's a wide range. That's only 20%, which leaves 80% bebopping along with no problem, right? So there's no, they are not, they're not having any kinds of concerns. Um, you know, there's also been a lot of conversation, and I didn't talk about it today, about sort of addiction to technology or addiction to pornography. Um, there are some studies that suggest um, Pornography addiction is a thing, and it, it sort of works the same way that other substances might in terms of um, your brain. There's less on youth um, specifically, and there's quite a bit that also suggests um, the sort of counterpoints in terms of the research saying, like, we actually need better studies. So I didn't want to spend a lot of time talking about pornography addiction because I, I personally feel that the literature needs to grow up a little bit, needs to get a little bit more um, detailed, and I'd just like to see some, um, some more studies with youth before we sort of say that youth are addicted. But if there is an addiction, and I could see how that would be possible, um, it's just like I think other substances, right, is that many adults do drink alcohol and they don't have a substance abuse problem, but a subset 
do, um, and, and adults and youth. And I think that would very similarly be the way for pornography, right? That many people may view pornography early in their life and then kind of continue to use it as part of their, you know, um, sexual life with their partner as they grow into adulthood, and they don't develop any kind of problems associated with that. But there may be a subset that that would be a problem. And I think we're so new in this field and so new in kind of this conversation that we don't have a good understanding of who those, those people are um, and who that would be. So um, all that said, I just sort of wanted to you know, point out that there are, are positives, and it's not always this doom and gloom, um, but we do want to be cautious, you know, and we want to make sure that youth are safe online. Um, I think that is that is the last of my slides, so I will pass it back. Hi, thank you so much, Dr. Taylor. Uh, this is Natalie Stites again. Um, we wanted to add this to the discussion here is some of the considerations or implications for tribal youth that are served uh, through many of the programs here participating today. Uh, sexting and uh, online uh, sexual behavior is a common way of expressing oneself for the teens and the youth. Uh, we just want to underscore that shame and judgment will not help tribal youth develop appropriate sexual behaviors now and into the future. And certainly, uh, secrecy is not helpful uh, in terms of these type of behaviors that young people who you are serving may uh, be engaging in. Um, and we also note that while this national study did not incorporate as a significant a sample of tribal youth or Native American youth in their uh, study itself, we know that tribal youth are very vulnerable generally considering high exposures to violence as witnesses and victims. Um, and they're vulnerable to adult online predators, um, a number of uh, say the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls that are uh, uh, being uh, testified to and anecdotally as well as academically studied, um, often they start out with an online interaction with an adult. Um, our youth also have those higher incidences of suicide ideation, uh, complex trauma, and also uh, family instability, whether due to absence of parents, incarceration, or even early death. Um, and in considering this, uh, we, we want to look at how, uh, much like Dr. Taylor's uh, overall implications and conclusion support, is you uh, do have the option of considering how your tribal laws and codes should be developed to address these special circumstances involving tribal youth, uh, sexting, and other potentially unsafe behavior in the digital world. Um, Generally, the tribe, uh, federal, and state jurisdictions all have varying levels of investigation and prosecution. Um, and as Dr. Taylor noted in uh, her research, uh, child pornography has been charged against youth at the federal level as well as state levels uh, for sharing uh, sexual content and photographs in a malicious or reckless manner. Uh, so we feel that this is something that uh, puts not only uh, the victims or the ob uh, subjects of child pornography in danger, but also puts um, unknowing or unaware youth uh, in danger of incarceration or involvement in the juvenile or adult criminal justice systems. Um, lastly, we'd like for you to consider that uh, this type of, say, uh, public shaming or revenge porn or sexual content that may be embarrassing to our youth um, explicit photos that uh, they don't have any control over being shared among their peers in the digital world or even publicly, these may be ongoing, uh, this may cause ongoing traumatic responses in our tribal youth. Um, and it may, may well include criminal conduct re requiring law enforcement intervention. What our center has is a visual simulation training uh, that has uh, been tested in tribal communities uh, for tribal police to engage tribal youth from a trauma-informed approach. Uh, these trainings are free and available on our website, and we strongly urge that um, everyone who's dealing with these type of issues in terms of serving the youth who uh, are experiencing um, online sexual behavior, engaging them, 
that a trauma-informed approach will help them and assist them in getting the services that they need, whether they be educational, uh, mental health, or even involvement in the justice system. Thanks, Natalie. Um, some potential applications for your Healing to Wellness programs or your Tribal Youth program. Um, I just, um, some things we can do to support our Tribal Youth in our programs are things like creating a fact sheet or a brochure for parents. Uh, just like us today, adults on the webinar, uh, parents in our communities probably didn't grow up in the same digital age as their kids. So they didn't have to deal with things like sexting or online sexual behavior or social media, or they probably aren't even familiar with terms like revenge porn. Um, we want to make sure that parents are at least aware of potential issues that their youth are going through. Like Dr. Taylor talked about, um, most kids and parents don't even know the risk and the seriousness of their actions. Uh, mm -hmm. Something to do for youth could be starting a talking circle. Uh, it's a good way to get conversation going and you can get an idea of how your group, group views the topic and be able to learn from them, hear their ideas and mindsets and their needs. And at a minimum, just let them know that you're someone that they can come to talk to if they're ever presented with something on this topic um, in their lives. Uh, you can invite experts and consultants to your community. Uh, I know ideally we'd all be able to talk, like, talk about things like this, um, like sexting and pornography, online sexual behavior to our kids, but um, the truth is that this topic can be really difficult to bring up and convey to youth in the way that we're meaning it. So bringing in an expert maybe from another program or even another division from your tribe could be a go good way to go about it. Uh, writing op-eds and commentary in local newspapers. Uh, there's been such a rise in writing op-eds that get published online and passed around through social media avenues. Um, even most local newspapers have articles published online as well. And that way you can reach um, any population or any generation, older and younger, um, through, those, um, through those avenues. Uh, you can produce an online newsletter or just a newsletter with youth on digital media use issues such as sexting and cyberbullying. Um, if you already have a newsletter, this could be a great potential topic to address. Um, or even if you'd like to share this webinar through your newsletter, we'll have this up on our website soon um, as an archived webinar, and we can always, you can always link uh, to it as a resource for your readers. Okay, um, some, other, some other potential applications for your projects. Um, that might involve some uh, more heavy lifting than our previous suggestions is maybe identifying healthy digital behavior among youth and adults, um, among uh, the two groups um, and within the groups as well, um, that norming uh, based in your culture, your geography, your history, your spiritual beliefs, identifying what is sexual health could be an important way of serving your community and the youth. Um, organizing a community uh, broad-based comprehensive response before criminal or other issues of face tribal youth in your community um, involving the schools, law enforcement, health care, uh, juvenile justice, the courts, uh, your youth services programs. Uh, a collaborative approach is going to be most helpful um, as an effort in prevention uh, for uh, this type of online sexual behavior that may be problematic or harmful. Um, and also, in a, for, specifically for those of you in the mental health area or who are uh, collaborating uh, in your juvenile healing to wellness court forums, uh, you can take a look at case plans and the screening and assessment tools uh, that may require some modifications to address electronic devices and behaviors in the digital world. Um, certainly, these type of behaviors can be uh, occur uh, contemporaneously with other types of unlawful conduct, um, it, such as underage alcohol or substance use. Uh, and so, uh, 
looking at how your forms and procedures may uh, allow for that could be very helpful to the youth and to the community at large. Um, and then also uh, just encouraging generally the use of social media pages and places on uh, Facebook, on Instagram, on Snapchat. I think I'm revealing my age when I first said Facebook, um, but you know, things that are relevant to the tribal youth and, and that are also accessible to their parents. Um, these are some of the potential applications or ideas for that. Um, we'd love to hear more from you either in the chat box or the question and answer pod uh, regarding what or how uh, this information regarding online sexual behaviors could be useful to uh, the tribal youth who you serve in your community. Uh, some of our resources, uh, Hillary, you want to take this one? Yeah. Um, thanks, Natalie. Uh, some of our resources, actually like Natalie talked about before, um, with our tribal policing simulation, I just wanted to make this audience aware of our virtual training simulations on our website. Um, again, our website is tribalyouthprograms.org. And on there, we have virtual training simulations. Um, social media can bring on so many issues with mental health and heightened emotions. Um, you know, one post online or one text message could change a young person's life, and it may create a reaction where they're acting different to their friends or posting some scary stuff or they're not performing at school or ditching class. Um, we have virtual simulations that can help youth talk to their friends about mental health um, and suicide. Uh, it can be taken on a regular web browser. We also have an app available on Apple and on Android. Um, it's kind of like a video game. Um, you have an avatar and you talk to another avatar. And it really helps youth talk to each other when they see something is wrong. Um, even one of the first scenarios in the simulation is one youth talking to another and they're saying, hey, I saw you post online. Um, saying that you're sad, what's up with that? Um, so it really helps youth talk to one another um, about what's going on. We also have another training for high school educators or anyone working with youth. Um, it helps them talk to youth about their emotions um, and what's really going on with them and helps them uh, get youth to open up um, and eventually referring them uh, to what they're needing. The third simulation, like Natalie talked about is um, for tribal police officers, um, and it, focus on, it focuses on interactions specifically between tribal youth and tribal police. So it helps them not to be re-traumatized by, um, not to re-traumatize tribal youth and approach them with a trauma-informed perspective. Um, another resource we have, uh, that we'd like you guys to check out is the National Indigenous Women's Research Center. And um, it's another place where you can find resources uh, for Native youth regarding relationships and healthy sexuality. Uh, so please, please check both of those out. They go hand in hand with this information and can be really helpful to you and your program. Yeah, I just wanted to include um, some resources as well that might be helpful for any of you um, working uh, with, with youth and, and wanting more resources about um, technology and internet safety. Um, I just realized this morning I was looking up the Kids Smart logo there has now actually become uh, childnet.com. But all of these websites have uh, information for parents, for professionals, for youth um, on safety, on um, how to have conversations about these um, topics. I think the UK, Safer Internet Society UK, I think has a lot more in terms of resources available. Um, a lot of these are international websites, um, but they have, you know, some topics about like what, do, how do you have a conversation? If they have gotten um, a selfie has been sent out, that is a new image of them, and now it's everywhere. Now what do you do? Um, so they kind of have some um, both the preventative and also how do you respond when these things happen in order to not sort of um, result in even bigger um, challenges. So just a lot of different um, information, um, good, good digital parenting and policy and things like that on all of these different websites. Just wanted to include those.
Hello? Do we have any? All right. Um, so it doesn't look like we have any, um, any questions in the Q&A field. Um, Um, so, if you guys have any, again, um, you can email us or contact, contact us after the webinar um, from our website or just our emails. Um, Natalie, do you have anything else? Hi. I, uh, I just wanted to underscore these new resources and the new way of looking at this. Um, thank you for your presence today with us. Um, I'd like to close in a good way, um, and in that way, I want to offer the group a prayer. Um, Sankashila, please help all of the people here gathered today to serve the youth, uh, to help guard their spirits and guard our future as Indian nations. Sankashila, Oyasin. Um, and with those words, I want to thank you again for your um, presence here. Uh, if you have any questions, we are all available through the center. Um, I want to especially recognize Dr. Erin Taylor for her, uh, her research and uh, sharing her knowledge with, with us as uh, a tribal youth program. And um, here is some, uh, their website that Dr. Taylor uh, it is also uh, available through is ncsby.org. Uh, and then our website, travelyouthprogram.org. Uh, please feel free to reach us via website, uh, email, or phone. Uh, thank you for the work that you do. Have a great day. Uh, there is a survey link uh, that has been shared with you all here on the line. Uh, if you could take a look at the webinar survey uh, and return it to us, we'd really appreciate your feedback so we can deliver the topics and the information that can help you in the daily work that you do. Again, please take a minute to fill out our survey. Thank you so much and have a great day.